Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hidden History Happy Hour. Alex Dean, what is the temperature in your home? It is raining like hell, and it can't be above 10 or 12. So, uh, autumn is well and truly in, and I'm not wearing a... Uh, this would be perfect dinner jacket territory. But you're comfortable, is my point. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, our guest will be b- bemused by this. I'm not sure he saw the last episode. Well, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna explain it. So, Willard, welcome back. You are one of our favorite guests of season one. Welcome to season Absolutely. two. Absolutely. Great to have I'm you with us, Willard. Going to get to you in one second, but I want to explain what I just said. So, and we'll talk about our booze. But our prior episode, as our burgeoning number of viewers and listeners will know, Alex was in a dinner jacket and his house was, I don't know, something like 2000 degrees. And that show, ladies and gentlemen, is by orders of magnitude the most popular episode of the Hidden yeah. History Happy Hour ever. So, mm. obviously, post hoc ergo proctor hoc. Our popularity depends on Alex's suffering. <laughs> I've got to have a bow tie on and sweat like, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> you know, all his all his level of formality. I mean, I absolutely there is that like video podcasts where everyone is in a dinner jacket and you sort of capture that Edwardian dining table experience. I think would be amazing. Yeah. Yes. Let me see. There's an old TV format called um, After Dark. It was very, very British. Yes. I used to love it when I was a kid. And basically what it was, was and my favorite thing about it was you had like six people sat around on a sofa and it came on about 11 o'clock at night on one of the smaller channels in the UK. And essentially you had like four, you, and it was, it was big intellectual heavyweights. You know, it was sort yes. of, you know. Malcolm Muggeridge was on all the time. Like, like, like yeah. this show. Yeah, exactly, exactly like this show. Exactly like this show. Except they're all sat there and they get as much booze as they want. And just they all smoke as well. And there's just like, the, you know, I went back and watched it recently and there are these like decanters of cigarettes. Everyone's like smoking the whole time. And they would just, basically they just ran the tape until they stopped talking. And like, you know, it went on at 11 o'clock and was filmed live until like four in the morning. And people would just sit, just, you know, and they would like have a topic like, how to solve the problems of southern sub-Saharan Africa. And you just have like sort of six guys in suits sort of sitting around going, it, I think it, Mugabe is a fine chap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if we if we if we if we had, had that, it would have been hosted by Dean Martin, I'm sure. It is kind of jarring to go back now and you watch like old Johnny Carson, or we had this guy Tom Snyder on after the Tonight Show, and they're all just smoking like chimneys the whole time. It's it's kind of you know, to a modern eye, it's kind of, uh, it's a little retro. Hey, so I want uh, uh, to unpack a little bit, one more thing about what I said, which is thank you so much for our, and literally I'm not making this up, thousands of new fans. Uh, we launched season two with our last episode. Must have been cracking, Alex, I don't know. But yeah. all of a sudden we got a big boost, including Willard. Your episode from last year uh, jumped about by 3X just by virtue of us having a new show. So we pulled you up with us. So cheers, everybody. Thank you so much to our cheers. new viewers. Cheers. cheers. Thank and you. Willard, you. Your time with us last year was so much fun. It was such a great episode. And uh, this time you're going to tell us a different story. I want to tell you a different story. It's an uh, American Wait, wait. Story. Hang on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Got to talk about the booze. There I think you guys are a little bit in yep. sync more than I am. What are you guys drinking? So well, I'm, drink- to you. I'm drinking a a raspberry infused Manchester gin from a can. So it's a can of gin, of raspberry gin. Yeah. Uh, and these are quite a thing in Britain, like can gin and tonics. Like you can get them, yeah. see them people oh. drinking on the way to Ascot on, you know, the races on a train. Everyone will be drinking can gin and tonics. But we're the, the work, uncivilized one ones. Days. We're the yes, ones you civil, are. uncivilized but ones over here. Britain has a Britain has a few things that are so um pre-prepared sandwiches are far more common in you know pack packages um yeah. in the UK than basically everywhere else. And pre-mixed drinks are very, very common uh in the UK in the way that, that Willard describes. I find them very useful for train journeys, as a matter of fact. All right then. And Alex, what are you having? I am back to my gin and tonic. Willard, I knew Willard was gonna have a GT, so I thought it'd be polite to match him. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to have a G and you can't really mess with the best. A big bucket of G&T is the answer for the uh, late evening recording. Well, gentlemen, I tried to be on the team. I knew you guys were both going to drink G&Ts. Unfortunately, I don't like added flowers with my booze. So I'm enjoying a vodka tonic. And I will tell you, I spent hours trying to find a Ukrainian vodka. 
for right. this drink. And I couldn't. So I did the next best thing to our new NATO allies, Finland. Cheers, <laughs> Finland. Cheers, Finland. Yeah. I think well, Stony is actually Ukrainian. Is it? I, I, think I, didn't wanna, I, did, I did not want to take the chance. I looked it up and I, there is suggestions on the interwebs that that's true but i i couldn't i couldn't confirm it i didn't want to take a chance yeah, well i know Russia. the um i know the ceo of stolly is a guy called damien mckinney he's a sort of ex-royal marine um at one point he branded himself the business commando and he's quite <laughs> a character uh but yeah he i'm pretty sure i'm at least like 75 percent sure that uh it's a ukrainian brand mm, well maybe you'll help us get him number. on the show maybe maybe he'd be, be a, a great guest, guest. Very for busy today, you're our great guest so what's your story willard so it's a story it's an american story this time last time uh our alex and i stories ranged all across africa and uh germans and uh germans and brits fighting in the jungles of the congo during the first world war but this one's a bit close to home for americans it's a story from the 1930s just after the prohibition era in the Roosevelt era, but it's a mafia story. So, do you know who Lucky Luciano is? I do. Yes. Do you know the name of the prosecutor who took down Lucky Luciano? Blimey. Because now, of course, I know the character from Boardwalk Empire, um, apart from anything else. And I don't think that features in it. So, I'm going to admit well, that I do not. I believe he's been serving since the U.S. War. I'm going to guess Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> no, sadly, it was not Rudy Giuliani. It was totally different. If they are blood related to the mobsters that Rudy Giuliani took down, because of course he did take mm. down mm -hmm. uh, people who are linked to the Genovese family, which yeah, Luciano yeah. set up as a crime family. But they aren't. It was not Rudy. It, sadly, it was not America's mayor who <laughs> took things down. But there you go. Uh, no, no. So essentially, the the woman, the female DA who took down Lucky Luciano, um, is a woman called Eunice Carter, and she was also the first black DA in America. She was the first Amazing. black woman. Um, but she was the first black. She was the first black DA in New York State. But she was also the first black woman uh, DA, and she took down Lucky Luciano. And this is the story of how she took Lucky Luciano down. All right, let's have it. Yeah. Go for it. So basically, obviously, it's prohibition has happened. Prohibition has been, it has enormously created the power of the Italian mob in the sense that they had the connections to bring in booze and this had made them all spectacularly rich. But when prohibition ended, of course, their sort of, their unique selling point of being able to run liquor joints disappeared and they all had to find new ways to make money and what they would do is they would run these numbers rackets that was the big thing it was all kind of you know they moved into all of the other illegal areas so as the sort of rum rows off boston are shutting down and the speakeasies are going legal they're getting into kind of illegal gambling illegal lotteries they're getting into vice they're getting to every single other area of crime and they're just trying to keep their they're just trying to keep the the money flowing effectively but they're so rich they can kind of invest in almost anything and they have so many people who are willing to just do the most appalling things for them you know uh and in particular like one particularly difficult mobster is a guy called Dutch Schultz sure. um do you know Dutch Schultz's real name Oh. He he went. His real name was Arthur Flagenheimer, which is a fantastic. <laughs> Dutch, Dutch Schultz sounds a lot cooler. Sounds a lot yeah, more. Yeah, it's definitely a more, cool more intimidating when you're trying to collect yeah. the debt. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, Dutch Dutch Schultz was like a sort of you know an extremely violent guy who ran and he ran the numbers rackets in Harlem. That was his big thing. So basically, you have these. He's a German gangster. There are Jewish gangsters, there are Italian gangsters, but he ran the numbers rackets in Harlem. So he controlled all of the, basically all of the kind of illegal activity in Harlem was run through this guy, Dutch Schultz. And there was a special prosecutor appointed to get him, to get Dutch Schultz. And this guy was called Thomas Dewey. And he's really famous for losing an election to Harry Truman. Dewey <laughs> wins. Yeah, yeah. He defeats Dewey Truman. Win. Big headline, yeah. yeah. Dewey yeah. defeats Truman, which of course was not true. But so he's another prosecutor who goes into politics. 
Uh, and he's working, he's appointed as a special prosecutor by another legendary Italian-American mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia. And LaGuardia basically wants, he wants the whole of New York cleaned up, but in particular, he wants rid of Schultz because Schultz is so incredibly violent. And Dewey comes in and Dewey hires a team of the best and the brightest in America. And these are all guys called Chauncey, who is men on Long Island. You know the types, right? You know, the sort of the people who are sat there in their dinner jackets and cigars. And, uh, you know, they, they, they look, they see what's happened in Chicago with Al Capone and they go after Schultz for tax evasion. And they... They get fairly close, but the really frustrating thing about Schultz is Schultz gives a lot of money out to, to you know, both both in a corrupt way, but also in a quite you know legitimate way. He's sort of a real pillar of the community, and um, they put him on trial for tax evasion. But Schultz keeps getting off, and this is enormously frustrating to Dewey. It's enormously frustrating to all the kind of you know, chorn season hunters around him, and so Dewey decides that he needs he needs something different. Right. This this whole situation with surrounding himself with Harvard educated lawyers just isn't getting him anywhere because what Dewey really cares about is results. So he finds this woman who had been uh, this woman, Eunice Carter. She um, she was from a very prominent family, black family who'd been free for a long time. They'd been free pre-Civil War and they're real pillars of the civil rights movement. But she's a kind of a black sheep of the family because she is very heavily involved in things like law enforcement. Her brother's a communist and they do not get on. Her and her brother do not get on at all. So she's very, you know, she's regarded by her family as a bit of a black sheep for being quite right wing. And she's gone to Smith. She's been the, I think she's the first black woman to graduate in law from Smith. And she's struggled to get work in, you know, it's 1930s right. America. It's hard for a woman right. to get a work, let alone a black woman to get work. But she gets work initially as a social worker. There's a series of riots in Harlem and she really distinguishes herself by, you know, doing uh, a lot of this social work around Harlem. And this is when Dewey notices her as a kind of a really interesting figure. He goes and sits down with her and they talk about how they could get Schultz. And legend has it, I don't know how how true this is. My source on this is a documentary voiced by Ray Liotta and Ray Liotta wouldn't lie to me. So, you know, that's a like a, a rock solid source. And Dewey's like, well, you know, we just can't prove anything on Schultz. We can never link a mafia figure to their crime. You know, we know that he's running the numbers rackets in Harlem. This is a neighborhood you know. You know, who do you think we could talk to? How would you get him? How would you get Dutch Schultz? And she says, well, I paid my way through university by being a telephone operator. We could just go down to the telephone exchange and listen to his calls. And Dewey's like, what? Right, where you can listen into people's telephone calls. And this is a big revelation. Like, this is a big revelation. There has been, it ha- the phone tapping has been done before. It's been done in like major prohibition cases, but it's all been very kind of like strictly controlled and it's not widely known. And it's not at this point constitute the constitutional legality of phone tapping is completely, it's completely unknown. It's widely suspected that it will, pro- it's probably illegal to listen into people's calls. Uh, so she, you know, she's, legend has it, she sits down with Dewey and she says, I paid my way to the university by being a telephone operator. And if you want to get what he's saying, you can just listen into his phone calls. And Dewey is shocked. Apparently, Dewey is shocked by this information because phone tapping, it was not completely new, but it was very, very new. It'd been used in a couple of trials. And the sort of broadly, the perception was that it was it was it was difficult to do, it was illegal. It certainly wasn't constitutionally validated at this point. Like they'd never been tested in a in a legal case. Well, and um, obviously, probably most lawyers didn't even know about it. Obviously, Dewey well, didn't know about it. Not even. Not only do most lawyers not about not know about it, but this is the really crucial point. None of the mafia there. doesn't. Yeah, yeah, the mafia don't know they can be listened into. So there's there's like if you listen to the tapes from I, mean, I don't know if you've seen the movie Donnie Brasco. Where you know yeah, all yeah, it's call. all oh you forget about it it's all in code like you know nobody ever right. says I want you to take that guy out I just want you to did kill you him. speak to the other guy about the other thing or the third yeah, yeah that no not that thing the other thing <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it's all very coded they know they could be being listened to they know it could be evidence this is why that code comes about because at the time I mean I don't know if you've listened seen the documentary Fear City but that is all based on wiretaps in the seventies in the Rudy Giuliani era. And it's just literally people will say things that are kind of almost imperceptible. They're like, yeah, do the guy, you know, the guy. Yeah, we should do the guy like it's, you know, and and the, the, the lawyers in those cases have to prove, well, those six words, they mean 
murder this particular character. Hey, hey, let me just time... say, sorry, sorry. Let me let me just interrupt you oh. for a second. So, I I don't know if people know this. I was a federal dr- uh, drug cartel prosecutor in the Clinton administration, and a lot of that job, once the case goes to trial, is having your DEA agent on the stand translating wiretap recordings from Spanish into English for the jury. And <laughs> I could tell you a hundred of these stories, but I'll just tell you one. There was one where the bad guys are saying uh, the 2.2 kilos of tires will arrive at 8 a.m. tomorrow at Port Elizabeth. Jury did not need much coaching to figure out what was going on there. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, at the time, nobody knew phone tapping could really be a thing. Nobody really mm-hmm. kind of understood that it could even happen. And so the wiretap from the time, you know, these guys, they don't live next door to each other. They will have long phone conversations about all the murders they're going to do. And very shortly, you know, they start listening in to the, the you know, the, the five families. Lu- Luciano has set up this organization. The five crime families, they've all kind of carefully organized their uh, their activities. Territory and so Wild- while Schultz has been on trial for tax evasion, Luciano has been kind of moving into his territory, right? So, uh, and sort of subtly taking it over. And he tells Schultz, oh, I'm just I'm just keeping the store open while you're busy, Dutch. Dutch is not <laughs> thrilled about this. And anyway, they bring another prosecution against, they bring another tax evasion prosecution against Schultz. And Schultz is so, this is all on tape, by the way, the, the, the tape recordings of all this. Schultz is so frustrated about this that he demands a meeting of the commission, the group of the heads of the five families. And at the head, at this meeting, he asks p- for permission to murder Dewey because he's like, no, Dewey has to die because he keeps prosecuting me for tax evasion. <laughs> Obviously, you can imagine they're at the telephone exchange listening into all this. Like, you know, um, that's pretty fair evidence. Yeah, they consider essentially the 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 before the the Fed before the cops can do anything. They Luciano says no, you can't murder Dewey because if you murder Dewey, there'll be a that there'll be a there'll be a, it'll be like Chicago. There'll be a crackdown, the likes right. of which you've never seen. Right, and so uh, Schultz is furious about this and he says that he is not accepting the commission. He thinks that this whole five families thing is absolute bullshit and he's going to kill Dewey anyway. And what are you going to do about it, Luciano? And he storms out, right? Okay. And this is obviously, it's a, it's a crisis for the people trying to prosecute the mafia because they're all probably like Dewey in particular is his, his children have to be put into a safe house, you know, proper kind of that midpoint of the untouchables thing. Um, and Schultz not only thinks he might go to jail, but also he's now planning to assassinate Luciano. And one of my favorite things about this is Schultz is real gold bug. Like he got really burned by the 1929 Wall Street crash. So he has all of his money in gold. And in preparation for this big assassination of Dewey, where he thinks like things could go wrong. And he, you know, he's, he knows that when he's been in prison, Luciano has been moving on his rackets. He takes all of his gold. He has it put into a safe and buried right? As you do. So he puts all his gold into a safe, he buries the safe. And in the meantime, alongside this, Luciano is like, we cannot allow him to kill Dewey. So he gets his best hitman, Alba Anastasia, who is the leader. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A legendary hitman, murder incorporated. 30 years later, he was at the famous meeting in New York. Yeah, absolutely. These guys yeah. are around for ages, but Anastasia goes, and the l- mafia legend has it that he murders Dutch Schultz, and the the safe full of gold has never been found. Right? Like, ah. There's a lot of evidence that the safe full of gold ah. existed has never turned up. But that is a Ooh. side note to this sort of wider story. So basically, Schultz dies. There's a there's an element of chaos, but then. Luciano had already been moving in and takes over all of Schultz's rackets. And 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 Luciano is a considerably better businessman than Schultz. So, like one of the things that sort of made Schultz like not a great mobster was people weren't massively loyal to him. And he right. had lots of problems with people skimming off the top and all of this kind of thing. But Luciano is much more organized and he's extremely difficult to catch. And they, you know, they spend about a year 
this is and and by this point um carter is brought full time onto the task force so she's an assistant da in manhattan and she's as i say you know she's an incredible first in in all of these ways mm. you know yeah. first uh she's the first black she's the I, I you know i can't remember all of the first but it you know being being the first black woman da in america in the 30s is a big deal and yeah. you know well, obviously, they never were able to sort of like pin anything on Schultz. Certainly, she got a lot of respect within the team for having been sort of so instrumental in getting all the wiretaps and things like that that basically precipitated Schultz having to try to murder Dewey and then getting himself murdered. Yeah. So she's got a lot of respect on the team. And the key thing that Dewey, like, you know, G- Dewey is many things, but he's certainly not prejudiced. And his key thing that he loves is he loves people that get results. And Carter has certainly got results on, she's certainly got results on Schultz. And the question is, can she get the results on Luciano? Because nobody else has been doing this. They've got a team of 30 lawyers. They've got a whole NYPD. You've also got, you know, the letter agencies. You've got, you know, the sort of, the Hoover era FBI. They're all trying for Luciano. Nobody can pin anything on him. He's completely untouchable. That is the, that is the word, that they're never, ever going to get anything. And even when they do manage to arrest mobsters, small-time mobsters and things like that, they, you know, they they pay bail. And these guys are, they're locked up in a code they call Omerta, which yeah. is a sort of a familial, this is the first kind of emergence of this Omerta code. Code of where, silence. Yeah, it's a code of complete silence where by, by essentially if you keep quiet, then the mob will look after you. Like they'll look after you, they'll look after their family. And the mobsters are incredibly loyal to Luciano. They they stick together. And, you know, this is this is the 30s, right? So, like, if you get arrested, it's not like, oh, you know, I'll get my lawyer and, you know, I'll get my rights. Like, you get arrested in 1930s New York. You know, you've got eight to ten Irishmen kicking you for 12 hours, yeah. demanding you talk. Like, you know, it's hardcore stuff. Um, yeah. But none of them, none of them crack. And this is the real problem that they're sort of, they're 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 thinking like Chauncey's and they're thinking like you know the guys from Yale, right? Okay, now but, I have to interrupt you, Willard, because that's the third yes. time you've made that reference. Explain to us colonists what Chauncey's means. Oh, a Chauncey is it, it's just a typical name I would think of as somebody who's at a dinner party in Long Island. So a sort of a Chauncey or a hunter or a you know not 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 action oriented. You know, no, he's, no, he's aiming at a classic East Coast kind of bow tie wearing effete old school republican noblesse oblige um mm. you might you might pri- say a private co- you school might, type stuff you might say yeah. a coastal elite alex yeah oh, but, but the, the the vanished uh, the vanished old uh, you yeah. know new england mm. elite yeah the it. people okay, who think the, the, the people who think the kennedys are disgusting because they're new money that sort of yeah. that sort of individual the people who are scandalized if you wear white after labor day that gentlemen sort of don't read other gentlemen's mail Exactly. Yeah, one hundred percent. That individual was that. Is that the Secretary of State at the time when he? It told, was. Yeah. Yeah. After yeah, World War One, when he dismantled all of our code breaking operations. Yeah. No. It's a. It's a. If only the world could be that way. But there you go. Anyway, so Carter is not is not bound by those rules of gentlemen not reading other gentlemen's mail. So she is. Um, she is. She basically figures out that. A huge because the prohibition thing is gone, a huge amount of the mafia's money is coming from vice. And she also realizes that the mafia do not think very much of the women in their employ. Right? So when the men get arrested, they get lawyers, they get, you know, they get representation, all this kind of thing. Do the women get representation when they get arrested? No, they don't. So she figures out where using the phone taps, figures out where the mafia run brothels are then she organizes raids on all the mafia run brothels and she fully throws the book not at the mobsters who are running the houses of ill repute but at the prostitutes and she tells them i will put you in jail for you know 10 12 15 years for for pretty minor vice offenses but she fully throws the book at them and then she says all you have to do is all you have to do is you have to kind of map out the you know she turns quite a lot of these women and gets them to talk and says that you have to map out the you know who are you paying money to and who are they paying money to and that's all combined with the wiretap evidence and they're able to build this sort of pyramid of money flowing back up to luciano but they can't quite draw the line they can't quite draw the you know even with all the wiretaps they can't quite draw the connection 
directly to Luciano and all these pimps and all this money. And one of the reasons they can't do this is being a pimp is being the lowest of the low in the mafia, right? Like if you're a pimp, you're, 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 you're scum. And obviously Luciano will take the money from these people, mm. right? As, as, as skimming off the top, but he doesn't want to be involved in that sort of, in that sort of business. Right. And so what Carter does is she gets the women and exactly how she gets them to do this. We don't know. She gets the women to testify that they have seen Luciano coming to all these brothels. They have seen him collecting the money, like in Which is back. presumably actually untrue. Well, I mean, obviously, I wouldn't want to in any way, shape or form suggest that a, a district attorney in Manhattan would ever be corrupt. It sounds too far down the tree for the, <laughs> the head honcho to be doing, right? To be the bag man going to brothels. Up until now, you you had a bona fide American hero there, but you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna dent her a little, I can tell. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so it certainly looks like. I mean, this is the this is the the sort of testimony of the sort of mob museum in Las Vegas. So, Luciano always insisted that he was framed, and it it does it's entirely possible that he, that, that, you know. So, there's a big thing where the the trial was trumped at the time. This is the one time where a mob boss has gone down for the actual crimes he's committed not for the tax evasion not for you know the not for all the you know all the sort of ancillary crimes but for the real crimes he did you know he was running these brothels he was collecting the money and they had multiple witnesses who you know and obviously these women's lives were at enormous risk for testifying yes. against him. yes and famously dewey puts him on the stand and Dewey cross-examines him in court. And Luciano is so unconvincing in court that the, you know, the, the the reports from the time are that essentially it's all the classic kind of mafia don questions where he's being asked these questions about money and you know, according to your, you know, according to you know your uh you know your sort of your your immigration papers, you haven't worked since 1927, and yet you live in this mansion on the Upper East Side. And how do, how have you come into this money? And he can never, he obviously can't, he can't explain it. So he's yeah. incredibly unconvincing on the stand, and the jury is not bent, and the judge is not bent. And even though, even though, like, I'm pretty sure everyone at the time was like, "Wow, how funny that he would go and collect the money himself." Nobody really knew how the mafia worked, and there's also so there's enormous amounts of the phone tap evidence as well, which shows that he's like in regular phone conversation with the guy who takes the money from the guy who runs the brothel and all this kind of thing. They're able to build a very convincing case, a very very convincing case, and Luciano goes down for being a pimp and the great thing about him going down for being a pimp is it's a per kind of like a personal thought. yeah 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 it's a come yeah, down yeah, yeah. yeah. carter like carter is like i'm gonna i'm gonna get this guy and i'm gonna get this guy in a way that humiliates him in front of his whole community because even though you know luciano always insisted he was innocent of what he was what he was accused of I mean, we all know he was extremely guilty of a whole variety of other things. So yeah, I mean, it's it's um. So that's the story. But the the other great thing about it is, is while she's doing the case, Carter is like on the surface, she has this amazingly, she has an amazingly kind of kind of respectable life where she's got you know, married to a dentist and this kind of thing. But it's recently come out in a biography written by her grandchildren. She was having an affair with the the band leader who was the inventor of swing music at the time. So she's like, she's Gosh. basically she's blowing, she's destroying the mafia, and at the same time, she's having an affair with basically like the David Bowie of the age. You know, so she's all right. She's a so, very colorful, so what a tale! Very Thank you, Willard. Great uh, story. Fantastic story. I'm sure Alex, the uh, former defense lawyer, has a lot of questions for you, but I. Uh... I I want to, I have some thoughts as well, but I want to know how do you know this story? Are you making a documentary about it? Why are you so, so deep in the weeds we, on it? So in 2021, we did a, a an episode of a series, a BBC series called Sideways that we make with Matthew Side, um, and we did an episode on the on the story then, um, and you know the the episode was all about kind of you know the pressure of being the first in anything and like you know how how that is, but that kind of whetted our appetite for the story and we do have a, a major 10-part documentary uh audio documentary audio podcast documentary coming out in november with iheart radio it's called the godmother and it tells tells the carter story in a sort of a rich really lyrical depth so you get the luciano story you get the um 
you get the Luciano story, you get the Dutch Schultz story, you get Carter's like links in between the two. Um, Luciano has an amazing like mad second life where he's deported after he he's deported like you know uh, after he served his sentence. His sentence isn't actually that long. He's right. deported back to Sicily. But then during World War II, he's actually recruited yes, by yes. the U.S. Secret he's Service. He's an American to, asset, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Recruited by the U.S. Secret Service to both control sabotage at the docks in New York, yeah. which is a real problem, but also to, um, yeah, to ease the American path into Sicily. You know, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of demolition explosives on bridges in Sicily that mysteriously go missing and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so he he does he does come back he does have a second half but also the the documentary goes into um, Carter's subsequent life as you know so, so her dream was to be a judge never this quite is, because her is this out is, is this documentary out yet because we'll put it in the no, show it notes comes out in November comes out in okay November. so we'll we'll put that in the show notes I'm gonna throw it to Alex but I have to ask you if they had wiretapped the conversations where Luciano essentially orders the killing of Dutch Schultz, why didn't they just prosecute him for that? Well, I, you know, you know what? Like, I'm not entirely... I think it's very difficult to prove that Schultz was murdered. That's the problem. It's very, very mm. difficult to prove that Schultz was murdered by any specific individual. So even though Luciano... And also there's a factor of, you know, the whole thing where um, Dewey's very cunning. He's a clever guy, right? And there's a whole thing of, you know, when the... I think, I mean, I can't read Dewey's mind, but there's a whole thing of, you know, whenever the, in World War II, whenever there's a battleship moving and they know it's moving because of Enigma, they'll sort of fly a bit further. Yeah, they, that's right. They fire. might not want to reveal their sources and methods. Yeah, I, I think they possibly did not want to reveal their sources, especially yeah. because I, I think it would be difficult to build. And also, wiretaps are, constitu- are not constitutionally legal. It's not until 1936, when all this has already gone down, that there's a case in front of the Supreme Court that, says wiretaps are legit well i'm so gonna circle back to that sure but the wiretap Al- will alex stand. i'm sure you have some thoughts well it's a great story and um did luciano ever comment publicly about what he thought of, of this woman who destroyed him uh as, not as far as i know like dewey was always very careful to give her the credit he would always be like um carter came up with a strategy she was the you know she was the woman who who really did it he was very generous with his own like with his own um passing on to carter and carter had you know she went and worked for the un there's a great interview with her and eleanor roosevelt just sort of sitting down having a chat but i don't as far as i know i don't think luciano ever really commented he don't don't think he even really really commented on dewey either like i think he um yeah he was a really private surprisingly private guy and so there's no kind of like no one sat him down for an interview in like you know 1938 and said how do you feel um, so yeah, he didn't, hmm. so there's not a lot on what Luciano thought about the whole process, but I imagine he was, it, he was not thrilled. <laughs> I think it's they, best. Those mobsters had a different approach to what the, the, the entwining of crime and celebrity or yeah, of infamy and celebrity that has, hmm. has come about. It's interesting thinking about what you just said, because I think Dewey comes out of, it comes out of history very well. And, um, to think that the American Republic had Dewey and Truman, who I think on anyone's uh, uh, books has got to be in the upper quartile of presidents, if not the upper decile. Um, you know, that that's why that's a fine competition between upstanding candidates. And I compare that to what it looks like the uh, American <laughs> electorate's about to be offered. I, I think what an embarrassment of riches your, your country yeah. had, Brian, uh, yeah. in that election at least. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, obviously I wasn't alive then, but uh, I go back, you know, seven, eight presidential elections. And it's just, if I may say, fucking depressing what we're going through. But that's enough. That's for another day. Uh, right. I want I want to pose something to you guys, though, since we're talking about wiretapping and the constitutionality and the legality of wiretapping. I know a little bit about this uh, from various parts of my career. If I told you I think Alex might actually know the answer to this, so you might be disqualified. But, well, Lard, if I told you that a president of the United States signed an executive order directing his attorney general to intercept all, double score, underline, all 
communications coming into or outside of the United States, outside a state of war. And his attorney general replied, well, sir, the Supreme Court just ruled on this, to your point of the decision, and uh, I can't do that. And the president responded, well, I'm sure they didn't really mean to constrain my authority. Do it. Who would that be? I mean, I'm guessing, I'm guessing FDR, I would guess. Yes. Yes. And 11 months before Pearl Harbor. Well, the thing about it is, is like one of the things I didn't realize is, you know, there's like, you know, you read any American kind of comic book from the time. There's always a Nazi spy around every corner or whatever. Actually, there was a there real, were. real there problem. Were. Like I yeah. was reading a fantastic book about Pearl Harbor recently. And like it turns out that um, the Japanese basically ran the hair salons in Hawaii and the way they were getting rid of information was officers' wives. Like, yeah, you know, 100%. Yeah, also yeah. Also been whilst chatting. Well, yeah, and also the, there was a spy ring in the, the, the officers' club in Honolulu. There was a spy ring of waiters who were all Japanese naval officers. Like, you know, well, and that sounds like there was so much paranoia about that. But it was very real. Like, you so know, all true. So, circling back to your uh, discussion of the... Um, I'll call them brothel women. Uh, historically, and this probably goes back, I don't know, to Roman times in some form, but the, the three best intelligence assets you can have, one, prostitutes, two, cleaning people, and three, and this probably may not go back to Roman times, but drivers, because no one, it's crazy, but people don't think they're actually listening and they don't think they speak the language and they don't think they could ever be in touch with an intelligence service. But right. this is this is like 101. This is spying 101. Get the prostitutes. Hmm. <laughs> on your, um, on your uh, FDR thing, so bravo, Willard. And I, I, I would have guessed FDR as well, but it may be because you told me long ago. Well, so I put the time, I fair. also put the, I also put the time frame in the question, which was a mistake. Yeah. But I would also say, if in doubt, guess FDR because he was in office longer than anyone else. So, you That's, know, all <laughs> things being just equal, the it's math. The, yeah. all things being equal, it's the best guess. But he, I, what I wanted to point out was he was also no respecter of the rule of law in some ways he's the only president in the modern era who genuinely tried to pack the court um and i yeah whatever people think of the present incumbent or the last one and people is very in your divided world people have very partisan views neither joe biden nor donald trump sought to get their way by extending the numbers of people they could nominate to the court they they are nominated in the appropriate way uh, people may not like the people they nominated but that's democracy for you and you know, it's a democracy when people it's a democracy in which people have their judges nominated by politicians which you can criticize separately but the okay. point is they were they were they were acting within the system fdr tried to subvert it Talk it's about true FDR and illegality my favorite fdr kind of side note to his career is his career as secretary of the navy was ruined because he ran an undercover operation to try to catch homosexuals in the u.s united states, states navy and he sent you know navy blue jackets undercover to try to find gays by romancing them this was just after the first world war and it came out that he was doing this and then obviously everyone was absolutely scandalized that he was you know endangering these men and uh you know he was wasting resources and all this sort of thing but he was deeply involved in the scandal and it would have been like a career-ending scandal for there's multiple times when fdr is mm. involved what for other people would be career ending scandals. And he's also hugely underestimated by his opponents, largely because he's in a wheelchair and people yeah. go, Oh, we'd have to worry about him. He's never, yeah. he's never going to rise to to prominence or anything like that. He but. has that in common with Trump. Well, mm. but th this sort of circles us back to a theme that we've talked about on this podcast many times, which is, you know, what is the uh, fairness dictate about judging people in the context of the times they were living and operating. I mean, right. you know, FDR, yes, he did all these things. But to be fair, I mean, there actually was no Supreme Court decision that said you couldn't wiretap for national security purposes. And he was pretty certain that we were going to be at a world hey, war in the next year. I, 
I want to be clear. I think FDR was a great president. I mean, I, I was pointing out that he he did many things we would think were were wrong, and all things being equal, giving me he was office longer than anyone else. He, people, you're going to make some mistakes. I still think he was a great president. <clears throat> It's also like okay. he, the times he's in as well, you know. Like yeah. we all—that's well, what I'm saying. That's, that's Brian's all. point. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I have another because you said um, people who get away with things that would be career-ending for others and blue jackets being misused and having waste resources. It reminds me that LBJ, when he went into the White House, president had a full-time naval masseuse. He had a. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say that didn't end happily for him. Well, I'm just saying it's. I mean, and, and uh, you know, Dick Nixon, uh, for all his faults, did not carry on that uh, that uh, tradition. So, Willard, last year uh, when you were on our show, you were talking about the fantastic uh, documentary that you had just made around Top Gun. Is that available? Can we see that? Yes, it uh it is, I believe it is available. Um it's called Fighter Pilot The Real Top Gun. Um I believe it's available to stream online. I don't know. It's it's certainly the um we definitely had like it's got a lot of F thirty five in it. And obviously like in the present security environment yeah. with um with Russia and so on, there were definitely points where we were asked like do not shoot it from there was like a whole angle you couldn't shoot it yes. from. We couldn't shoot it any from the rear but basically oh, that's interesting yeah it was a 270 degree cone where we could show it and there was like a 90 degree cone where we weren't allowed to film from um but the yeah suffice to say the yeah it it, it is available um it is a great show if i do say so myself it's a great show you learn a lot about the RAF the Royal Navy and the United States Marine Corps and the United States Navy uh, what it takes to be a naval aviator on a carrier um yeah it's there is a there is a version netflix is do so we did the british we did a british version with brits going that doesn't happen that often and that's why we did the doc but there is a there is a currently in production there is a netflix version where they're following a, a naval aviators all the way through from you know literal recruitment through to squadron service but it takes that takes a tremendous amount of time about seven years so that's filming at the moment um and when that appears i mean that will appear i'm sure you know when i first pitched the idea i just got married i didn't have any children the you know my one of my boys was five i think one of my boys was five when the show actually came out and i think when the netflix shows come out i think he'll be in I think he'll be in middle school by the time the Netflix show comes Good out. Well, we will, <laughs> we, will, long we, will time to we will we'll try to find a way for our viewers and listeners to watch it because I remember last year we were very excited for it to come out and I I have not seen it myself yet. I of course Top Gun Maverick I'm very happy to try since to find come out. The link. It's just, it's challenging because it was um it was on a channel called ITV in the UK which is one of the main channels in the UK. It's kind of would be up there with like CBS or NBC. It's kind of like a mainstream terrestrial channel of the ones that you could get on TV aerials back in the day. Right. Um, but they don't have a great kind of online presence. So I might be on it. I'm, it may have been sold to Netflix now. I'll have to check and we'll we'll we'll, we'll if it's out there, we'll put it in the show. And final question, at least for me, and thanks again for coming back. It's been great. Oh, before I get to the question, there's a plug. I guess I'm doing maybe I might be doing weekly uh, viewing plugs now. Um, Boardwalk Empire. Uh, Alex mentioned this at the beginning. This is Steve Buscemi. The guy that plays Luciano in it is amazing. It's mm -hmm. a fantastic TV show. It's like five seasons of the end of prohibition through kind of the beginning of the modern five families with that uh, big meeting in New York in the, in the early fifties. Great show. We'll put it in the show notes. Here's my question in your discussions, Willard with uh, uh, naval aviators in the U S and British side, how much is a uh, potential conflict with China looming over their thinking process? I think it's a lot is, is, is my honest opinion on that one. Like, um, so there's a really great RAND study that came out recently, yeah. which basically says, um, you know, like in a war over Taiwan, um, you know, that a huge amount of aircraft would be destroyed on the ground. And that's the biggest risk to Western aircraft. Um, so I definitely think like that was a bit of a that was a bit of a shocker for a lot of people, that kind of really, really detailed analysis. 
And so, yeah, I think it's I think it's top of mind for a lot of people. But but also people are very drawn to what's happening in Ukraine. Of course. And so, you know, of course, there's so much stuff where our understanding of warfare, of what would have happened in a Cold War showdown in the 80s, because that's a lot of the equipment that's being used. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So our sort of like Tom Clancy era understanding of what that clash would have looked like is being kind of rewritten, kind of. Um, by what's going on in Ukraine, but the big advances in things like drones are just yeah. you know Swarming that's where drones. everyone's kind of that's where everyone's kind of mind is. It's like sort of what do we do about kind of mass drone warfare? Like how on earth can manned <laughs> how on earth can man yep. platforms survive in that? So that is that is as far as I understand the kind of the big question. Yeah, it, does does it does it compel the world into autonomous warfare? And if so, what are the consequences of that? Because you can't manage thousands and thousands of drones in an hour with each human being, with a drone being, you know, controlled by a human being, each one. But what we're seeing, actually interesting, what we're seeing in Ukraine is like both the potential and the limitations of drone warfare. They're incredibly vulnerable to kind of electronic warfare disruption and things like that. So they're not going to solve all your problems. They're just going to change things. I think is the, is the, and also I think there's a lot of people in the West who look at the war in Ukraine and go, well, well, a Western war would not look like that even against a peer opponent because the air component would be completely different. And that yeah. is, I mean, I look at the war in Ukraine and it looks, it looks more like world war one than anything Horse. else. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's a, yeah. you know, it's an artillery war. And, and the other thing I think a lot of people don't realize is the the Ukrainians don't have to go much further than where they are now, yep. and their They're artillery totally right. can control the one road into that the whole you know eastern part, the whole sort of western extent of um, Russia's push into Ukraine. And I think once they, I think they only have to get about five miles for, for, further forward yeah. from where they are, or zero if the West steps up with a little bit more long range weapons. Yeah, exactly. But they don't yeah. seem nobody. Nobody apart from Britain sending things like storm shadows. No, to... it's uh, it's. I have to say it's embarrassing. Uh, you guys so, are just, in the vanguard. Will I just finish your your thought? If they get five miles further, if they get five miles further from where they are. Then pretty standard artillery will be able to close that road down. And the Russians are already having massive problems supplying um, things in that pocket. But once if they get five miles fur- further forward from where they are, then the they can control the supply route into that whole extent of the map where there's basically there's one road running by the sea uh and it you know that that whole southern front could fall if the russians go if the ukrainians go five miles forward but the problem with it is is going five miles forward as world war one shows us could take it's very could take years. years yeah but but you get you get that road you get um the bridge and you get the tokmak uh train station that's going to be tough for the Russians to sustain anything after that. If we can get, yeah. There. Well, Ard, uh, we got to let you go. But what are you? Uh, what are you putting out in the world? What should what should our viewers look for? So, I think the thing I would direct your viewers to at the moment is we very recently had the world number one podcast, uh, which is called The Girlfriends, which is an amazing story about a group of women in Las Vegas, Jewish women in Las Vegas, who all realize they've dated the same man. And they all realize over brunch, very sort of sex in the city. It all happens in the 90s, very sort of sex in the city type moment. They've all dated the same man over brunch, but they all realize they all broke up with him for the same reason, which is they thought he might be a murderer. And then they, one of them. That's revealed, a pretty good that's elevator a, that, pitch. I didn't see that coming. That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, they all that's thought a good gets, elevator com- pitch. That gets friend. commissioned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They all thought wow. he was a murderer and that secretly. And then they share this between each other. Oh, I always found this a bit weird. And then they all sort of all the stories come out about why they all thought it was a murderer. And then one of them reveals that he she'd found out she'd broken up with him because she'd found out he'd been married before and his wife had disappeared. So they all get together to try to solve the disappearance of his wife. And you know, and this is a true, a more or less true story. True story. True story. It was world number one podcast. It's a it's, if I do say so myself. It's probably one of the best things I've ever made. It's an incredible story. The host of the show is one of the women who's, who who um, who went on the journey to try and unmask Dr. Bob Birenbaum. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a fantastic story. Um, so really it's the, the girlfriends. 
called The Girlfriends. Yeah, it's a fantastic show. It's with iHeartRadio. But uh, to be uh, fair, but to be fair, we're the best podcast you've ever actually appeared on. One hundred percent. I mean, I'm, I'm there you go. on narrative shows, unfortunately. So there you go. Well, hey, thanks for coming Great back. Man. We can't. We can't wait to have you for season three. Viewers, listeners, thank you for this massive increase in interest in our show. We hope we're worthy of it, and we'll continue working on it. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.